Our Old Testament reading comes from Psalms chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first six verses today. Why do the nations rage, and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers conspire together against the Lord, and against his anointed, saying, Let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Let's pray. We ask you, God, to speak to us by your Spirit. Teach us in your word this day. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I wasn't planning on going into Psalms chapter 2. I was actually going to skip a few Psalms there and just kind of coast across the mountaintops of the greatest Psalms. And the more I kept reading this Psalm, the more I realized it's very applicable in our lives today. And so we're going to look at these first six verses here today, and then we're going to look at the rest of it next session. So I hope you're tuned in with that for us. Um, it is very important that we understand that the Old Testament speaks to us in spiritual values, even though it is a literal picture. It's a physical type and a shadow of the spiritual reality that we live in because of Jesus Christ. Okay, And that's important we keep that framework as we go through these passages of Scripture. First of all, verse 1, Why do the nations rage? and the people plot in vain. Well, worldly authorities want to do it their way. They really do. That's why they do what they do. That's why they're angry all the time. That's why they're fighting God, because they want to do it their way. They want more power, more control, and ultimately, your money. And they think wealth will save them. They think wealth will make them more powerful. And it might, from the physical, worldly standpoint, but in the big picture, that doesn't hold an ounce of anything in eternity. Proverbs 16.2 says, All the ways of a person are clean in his own sight, but the Lord examines the motives. A lot of people think they got that put together. They can do it right. They want power. They want control. They got the right thing going on inside of them. A few chapters later in Proverbs 21.2, 21, it says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Wow. This reflects back into Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, you know, the Lord checks out our motives. He judges us by our intent, it says. That's our motives. And sometimes we're going to miss the mark. But what was our motive? And if our motives are rotten, the Lord knows them. And if they're good, He's okay with that. Okay. Now, Psalm 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is correct, and all his work is done in faithfulness. In other words, you're not going to do it by the ways of the world. The authorities and the powers of the world aren't going to get it accomplished. You know, they think they can. They won't. And they rage against God because they want to be better. They want to take over. They want to have control. They want to have power. And they want to have money. Jesus said you can't serve both. You either serve God or you serve mammon, which is the things of the world, which includes money. One or the other. It goes on in verse 2 of Psalm chapter 2 to say, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. The world has a strong desire to get rid of God Jesus, Christianity, because they want to sin. They enjoy sin, and they want to keep doing it. It's almost natural to them because they're born into sin like we all are. But when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, and we receive forgiveness, forgiveness of our sins through his shed blood, and we repent, and we're turned, and we're changed, and we're being transformed, we have a different outlook on life. We don't want to destroy God's will in our life. We don't want to do our own thing. We want, don't want to enjoy sinning. As a Christian, when you sin and you know it, you oh, oh, why did I do that? That's good. 
It's bad when you're a Christian and you sin and you don't think anything of it. That's when you've got a serious problem and that's when you're really sliding back, as we say, backsliding. You're going backwards in your faith. You've got to be careful. When you sin and you know, oh, and we all do, <laughs> myself included, that's when you know you're on the right track. Your motives are good. Well, it's interesting because they don't want anything to do with Jesus. They don't want anything to do with God. They want to do their own thing. They want to destroy all that, but there's still only one name by which you can be saved. Acts 4.12. And that's the name of Jesus, the authority of Jesus Christ. In that word name means authority. The authority of Jesus Christ is more powerful than any other authority. Go on in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. Yeah, I'm sure this is a picture so that we understand what God thinks of these people who are trying to destroy him, his faith, his people, all of these things. He's sitting there going, so you think you got it figured out, eh? Go for it. And there are times and seasons when God says, have at it. And we may be in one of those right now. And I assure you, that Jesus Christ is still on the throne. He's still the king. He's that anointed one that he's set in, as we're going to read right here. He says, Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. In other words, when God gets ready to talk, the world's going to buckle. Okay? He says, But as for me, I have installed my king, and it's interesting because the word king is capitalized, which means deity, upon Zion, my holy mountain. Then we must ask the question that is going to scare some people. We say, what is and where is his holy mountain? Now, if we live by the flesh, we're going to run over to the Middle East in Palestine, in the land of Israel, and say, it's Zion right there in Jerusalem. That's what it's always been. It's that temple mount. That's where this is all happening in the big picture. Wrong. And it's sad because most people think that that's it. And they bow down to a land and a people group who we should not be angry with or destroy or be against. But people are people. And Paul says repeatedly there's no difference between a Jew or a Greek. Paul said it. I'm not arguing that unless you want to argue the scriptures and the validity of the scriptures. Okay. Paul says that. We don't live by the flesh. Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him, worship him in the flesh. No, he didn't. He said, in the spirit and in the truth. It's very simple. We are spiritual beings created in God's image. God said, let us make man in our image. God is spirit. God is light. God is love. We're made in his image. Okay. The problem is, is we only live by our flesh most of the time. We have to stop and think about that. And Paul repeatedly in his letters says, we are to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, not the flesh. He keeps talking about things of the flesh and saying, that's no value. What are you doing? That's not what this is about. We are spiritual beings living in temporal bodies, as Paul calls them, tents, a very fragile thing. Because we are spiritual. Now, a lot of people have struggles with that. Say, you, you're not human beings? No, we're not. Very simply, we are not. And that's where the problem comes in. And if you really believe you're a human being, you better stand up here, go get your shovel, go out to the cemetery and dig your relatives up because you did a great disservice by burying them or burning them. Because if they're still a human being, and we're human beings, we have done some weird stuff along the way. And I can say that because I was a funeral director for years. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now that's in a little extreme, but understand what I'm saying. And that's very important that we get this right. Now, <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 22 and 24 tells us what this Mount Zion is really about. Because the Old Testament is a physical type and a shadow of the New Testament. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Go read it. He says in Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, But you have come to Mount Zion, he's talking to the church, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly one, the heavenly Jerusalem, 
and to the myriads of angels which are in heaven, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, not Jerusalem over in the Middle East, in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to all the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So we need to understand this very clearly. The Old Testament is a physical type and a shadow of the reality of Christ. The reality. I have a shadow here. You probably can't see it. But my shadow is connected to me, but my shadow isn't me. Okay? Old Testament. Physical type shadow. Reflection is connected to Jesus, but Jesus is the fullness of that. And here we read it in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to festival or new moon or Sabbath day. I'm talking about all these things that we do of the flesh. Okay? Everything. Eat, drink, holidays, even church day, Sunday. Mm. Things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The reality is Christ. Those are all shadows. They connect to Christ. They point to Christ. The shadow always points to the reality. But the reality is Christ. It's Jesus. It's Him living in us, the hope of glory. And then we read in 1 Corinthians 15.46, the pivotal hermeneutic filter. Now, again, I'm not interpreting this. We're letting the scriptures interpret themselves. But we have to understand how that works. And Paul tells us very clearly. He says in 1 Corinthians 15.46, However, the spiritual is not first. Now, he's not talking about priorities here. He's talking about chronology. Because in this whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about we're physical people. We die. We become, you know, we're raised into spiritual new life. You know, and the resurrection is vitally important. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, we got no chance. We got no hope. Okay? And he comes down to the end and he says, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural or the physical. That's another word for that. Then the spiritual. What's he saying? He's giving us the whole picture of the overview of Scripture. First, there was a physical group, and that was a type and a shadow. Two other verses we just read that point to the reality of Christ, the spiritual. Okay? Now, do we have that down perfect? No, I don't. But we are called to live in Christ and to Christ to live in us. That's a spiritual experience. When you look at me by the flesh, you don't see Jesus. Now, you may see my reactions that reflect, hopefully, the life of Christ in me. But you don't see Jesus, you know, the long hair and the beard. Or, oh, Joe looks like Jesus. No. It's a spiritual reality. And when we get that right, we start understanding this. And that's where God speaks to these people who want to destroy him. And he says, I put my king in Zion, the holy mountain. Well, it isn't in the Middle East on the planet Earth. It's in the heavenlies, and that's supreme with ultimate authority over the entire creation. And we can rest in that. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. May we truly reflect that in our lives as we study and as we meditate day and night. In your name we pray. Amen.